Oh boy, this is now the fifth time I've attempted to record this podcast because there's all kinds of issues going on, and quite frankly, my brain is fried. It's been a week of quarantine. It's weird to think that it's really kind of only been a week of quarantine. Uh, I was in New York one week ago today, and on Tuesday of last week, I was in my office working, and Wednesday of last week... I was at Compound Media recording an episode of Nerdgasm with Karen Margolis. And a week later, the Dow's plunged down to 2017 levels. Uh, Every state, like over a million Americans, all shut down, can't go anywhere. No uh, restaurants are open in New York, no bars. Same thing in Illinois, which is where I am now. I went back to Chicago to record Brendan Gay's, uh, to help record, Beyond uh, introduce Brendan Gay on his uh, comedy album. That's been canceled. And then uh, New York airports got shut down. All the flights got shut down. And now here we are. Um, it's weird because I've been waiting on posting an episode for a little while because a lot had been up in the air. And I thought, eh, we'll let some of this stuff blow over. <laughs> and then lo and behold, the entire world, like a bomb went off. This is the weirdest time and the weirdest thing I've ever lived through. Same with you. Nobody alive today has been through like anything like this before, really, in the same way, unless you were in another country in which uh, some outbreak like this happened. This is just the most bizarre, strange, eerie situation. Walking around Chicago a little bit today. Nobody was observing social distancing. Super, super strange. Just, Hank, just go by yourself step away from people even on the sidewalks don't go out with your dog and think it's funny when your dog's jumping all over people man your dog could have coronavirus all over him this is the weirdest freaking time super strange i've been sitting on a whole bunch of episodes and uh, some of these are really good this one is great this is brandon roten he's the cmo of potbelly here in chicago and uh i've really known him for a while he hasn't known me but and but recently but i've known him for a while he was uh the head of social media digital marketing over at wendy's and presided over the change of the wendy's voice uh on social media on twitter that became really famous that wendy's the account dominated twitter for a while it was like basically it was hilarious people would people would screenshot it they'd send it around he employed a few comedians, which was a genius idea, to engage with people on social media, and completely changed the brand around. That Wendy's used to was a dying brand until Brandon Roten created a strategy that basically took over the whole brand. It was so successful. So this guy is, not only is he personable, he's funny, he's fun, he's got a great head on his shoulders. We have a really interesting discussion about the role of comedy, the role of, of brand voice, of authenticity, of all of these things in marketing. And it's funny because I'm a guy who honestly has hated marketing for a long time, working in the periphery of it, worked inside of marketing organizations. Honestly, I mostly don't care about them. And if you're a marketer listening to this, which you maybe are, just know that I don't hold it against you specifically. I think that probably, first of all, most of the marketers I know and worked with have been great people. They've been wonderful. They've been fun. They're creative. They're interesting people. There's just something about almost the group think that comes from sitting around with a bunch of business you know executives when the creative ideas start coming out that tend to water down and de if there's an opposite of inspiration whatever that is tends to be what happens to a lot of different brands and in teams I've worked with and for that can even sometimes happen to people who I like and care about and have great ideas otherwise. It's just that when it comes to conforming to this world of like business or this world of consumerism, it just takes every the soul out of something. And so Brandon Roden's done something kind of amazing. He's presided over a team of people that have done the opposite, actually. They've created a soul within a brand that was otherwise dying and then came back. So we talk a lot about, although this was some years ago, we talk a lot about his experience at Wendy's. We talk a lot about his experience working at Potbelly and what he's doing to that brand. I'm sure that that's shifted slightly in the world that we live in now. I know Potbelly's now takeout only and he's working with delivery because quite frankly, that's the only thing you can do right now while this is being recorded. 
So for people in the future who end up listening to this in business school because Brandon Roten has written the book of the class that you are working on and you've Googled it and this is the name that came up and you are now listening to this podcast, just understand that this was a time in which everybody was forced to stay home because the Trump administration failed to see a virus coming. That's exactly what happened. And honestly, they could have seen it coming. It's like we had months, man. We had we had a while. We had weeks between when this appeared in China and anybody could have done anything about it. So now you know how I feel about that. <laughs> Comedy's been canceled. Every comedy show that anybody's gone to or done has been canceled. Everybody is just at home now. Comedy to you is Netflix or tons of people streaming things on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I'm doing this. I need to get onto the Instagram, you know, trend of streaming, of getting things on there. But unlike Brandon Roten, who can figure out what a brand voice is, I don't even know mine. I've been doing this for years and I still don't know my own voice. Sardonic, maybe. Goodness gracious, Brendan, make a fucking decision. Uh, seriously. Well, guys, uh, this is the most unprofessional start to a rather very, very professional uh, podcast with a very professional man who is a honestly a, a genius, a very intelligent man, um, and really, really grounded. Uh, Brandon Roten was very kind. He was very nice. I went to the Potbelly headquarters here in Chicago, Illinois, and sat down with him, uh, set up all my equipment in his office. Super cool guy. And uh, what's funny about it is I've known him for, like I mentioned, for years. I've reached out to him for a long time. And when I finally sent him a message saying, hey, do you want to do a podcast? He was like, yeah, sure. Love to do it. And he knew who I was. So if you're somebody out there doing sales development work and sending out cold emails and cold calls, just understand those actually go through. People recognize your name. So he knew who I was because I've been reaching out to him for almost five years. And uh, and finally, he, um, you know, this was a good excuse. And, and he said very kindly, he was like, yeah, I always read everything you read. And you know, tried to reply if I could, but most of the time I just didn't have a need and I was very busy. So what can you say? Uh, I'm glad he sat down and did this, though. I owe him one. He was really nice. Hopefully I can figure out some way to return value to him because this podcast intro isn't doing it. <laughs> Big shout out to the Russian Federation, my normal listenership, uh, Kingston, Jamaica, and Denmark. All you guys, I don't know why you listen to this podcast. <laughs> But Vlad Putin, I know you're, I know that it's the coronavirus is a lot worse over there than you're admitting. I'm pretty sure, Vlad. So anyway, uh, like, comment, subscribe, post something. Honest to God, guys, I could use it. Let's, let's try to pull together. Let's try to message each other. Let's try to, to be good people right now. Uh, us extroverts are dying. If you're an introvert, you're loving this. This is the greatest time you've ever existed. If you're an introvert, if you're an extrovert like I am, you're losing your freaking mind on a daily basis. I feel bad for, I feel bad for Gloria Scott, with whom I'm staying because she has to deal with all of my extroverted behavior. She has to be the generation, the generator of all of my social approval right now because I can't do comedy and I can't see anyone else. So, anyway, without further ado. Hope you guys are hanging on. You can tell that I'm about to lose it. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging on by a thread. But you know who isn't? Brandon Roten and the amazing Brandon Potbelly. They've done a great job, and he's doing a great job. And I'm glad to have him on here. So please take a listen. And meanwhile, the madness continues. Welcome to the Madness Continues podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for doing this. It's been uh, this is kind of an interesting meeting because I've been I don't know. Do you do you know? Just <laughs> I was thinking about questions I wanted to ask coming in here, you know. And I was like, I got to start off by asking Brandon. Like, do you did you rec do you recognize my name or did you recognize it when I commented on LinkedIn? I, I think I did. I think I did. You might have to remind me uh, of of the uh, context, but I think I, I was did. like, because I I reached out to you in your capacity at Wendy's for I was working at Vibes, and I must have reached out to you 
I mean, I think I, ta- I mean, I, I even like texted you on your, I don't know how I found your personal cell phone number. Yeah. I think it, at one time you must've placed it on like LinkedIn or it might've been somewhere for but, five minutes. And then yeah. you found me. And then I was like, yeah. son of a bitch. And like <laughs> grabbed it. And I think I like texted and called and like just anything I could do to try to get a hold of you. And I'm, and I know, I mean like, and by the way, no love lost at all. in the fact that I think that you responded a couple of times and it was very polite, but you were like, yeah, not interested or whatever. Mm-hmm. I totally understand. I mean, you guys, people in the digital marketing space are just constantly, I feel like, harassed by millions of people who look and sound all the same. Yeah, we, we, I get probably uh, 100 emails a week. Yeah. Uh, pitches. <laughs> so I, I would say if you're, if you're in that world, uh, make sure you understand what you're pitching, who you're pitching to, and, and have something interesting and unique to say. Otherwise, it's probably going to delete pretty Yeah, quick, yeah, so. pretty quickly. And then probably, in, and then everything will be funneled right into the spam folder That's after right. that. That's how it works. That's how it works, man. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was just very funny because I saw uh, you, how this came together as you um, – uh, I commented on a on a post on LinkedIn, and I was like, "Oh my God, I've been reaching out to I've reached out to you forever, man!" Like, and you were, and I was like, "Do you actually want to sit down and do like a podcast?" Which is obviously what we're doing now. And you were like, "Just send me a message." And I have to admit, it's funny because I remember talking to my team about you when I was in that in the world of doing a lot of sales dev for. I used to work for Vibes just down around the corner here, and then I uh, was director of sales dev over at Cheetah Digital. I don't do anything right now, but. Um, it was funny because I remember talking to them about you and being like, some executives won't get back. They're good guys though. Like Brand Roden, good example of that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, eh. so it's just kind of funny that I was, I just was walking over here going, I wonder if he remembers I, or my name sticks out to him at all. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. A little <laughs> history. <laughs> um, well, so thank you again for sitting down and, and doing this and talking through stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, we can, this conversation can kind of go anywhere, but I think it's interesting because you're, you know, here in Chicago now, you're at Potbelly, a, a, a really a, an amazing brand and a kind of a classic brand, not just for Chicago, but I feel like for, I mean, especially for Chicago, yeah. but, you know, in, in just the, I feel like in the world of, uh, of, of quick serve, you know, fast casual dining or whatever, it's like a brand that everybody in the United States knows, certainly in the Midwest. And so it's pretty cool that you're out here now. You've been here for about a year and a half. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, spent a lot of time in uh, in other brands like Wendy's and and, and a few others. But uh, but I, I love brands that have sort of at their core uh, a great story to tell. Yeah, and especially brands that are you know I'm the kind of guy who gets dogs from the pound. Brands that have been beat up a little bit. Yeah, and not quite in their their prime. Yeah, uh, so we can rework that brand and and Potbelly sort of fits that. That yeah. Mold perfectly. So. We'll we'll get into talking about that. I think in a little bit, but yeah. it's leading up to this conversation. I was talking with some friends of mine, and like I interview all kinds of different people on the podcast. I have comedians and actors, artists, business people, um, you know, people from the world of marketing, people from the world of sales, just all kinds of different entrepreneurs, lots of different people. Um, and when I was talking to some people, I was like, I'm really excited. I'm gonna go meet with with Brandon Roden and they were like what does he do and I'm like well I'm like I came he kind of developed the brand the digital brand strategy behind like Wendy's and people were like oh my god that that I love that company's like digital yeah, presence yeah. and like people so you like really and I kind of want to get into this is like you were there for seven years you were saying and like you you really put your fingerprints on that brand and as, as we understand it on online like what you kind of developed a reputation, I think, for being a guy who understood the online space. Yeah. How did you, and this is a big question, but how did you you know, move through developing that brand into what it is now? Because I feel like it is an unmistakable online presence now. Yeah, so you know, I started with Wendy's in 2011. And, and I mean, with no offense intended, people almost like the digital brand more than they like the actual company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, I think that's a compliment to the marketing, right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, uh, I started with the brand in 2011, and, and it was part of a whole new management team, a new CEO came in, and, and I was brought in as the first person in the organization with digital in their title. Yeah. Uh, so I was the director of digital for Wendy's, and, uh, and the brand had essentially a, a decade of decline in traffic yeah. at that point. It just split off Arby's. Uh, the stock was in pretty rough shape. It was at three dollars and change. It, the 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 brand itself was in pretty rough shape, and, mm. and in fact, the the kind of momentum behind the new CEO coming in and, and the new team coming in was we have to either fix this or figure out a way to recast it entirely, like dismantle the company or, or whatever. Yeah. So it was a it was a pretty critical moment in the history of the company. Well, did they? Okay, so when you moved into digital, so first of all, you owned that function since the beginning because literally yeah. there was nobody else who yep. had that had had that place. And in 2011, I feel like is when that was about when I maybe slightly earlier than 
I think a lot of digital transformation was kind of going on at a lot of, especially, I would say, old school brands like uh, like like Wendy's. Yeah, there were brands in the tech space who had already made some progress. Dell was a good example at the time. Yeah. It was big in social media, and and that's actually where I came from. My agency side was a lot of a lot of tech work, and and the old school retailers, especially restaurants, hadn't even scratched the surface yet. In fact, I was the first QSR period to go to Facebook's headquarters with my team in 2011. Really? So I'm, I'm, I vividly remember walking in with my agency and they drew a picture of Wendy. You know, like <laughs> if you've ever been to Facebook's headquarters, they have yeah. that wall you write on. Uh, and and we drove the Wendy's logo and we were the first QSR fast food restaurant to do that. So so it was very early You paved days. the way for Vladimir Putin. And well, maybe, people. maybe, who knows? <laughs> He's but, a listener. Uh, <laughs> maybe. But uh, but yeah, so so really the, the beginning of the, the process was we had to fix the brand as a whole. It, it became essentially an LTO factory, like you know the temporary items that we pushed in the world for three or four weeks at a time, and a discount world of of sort of ninety nine cent menu, and that's yeah. all the brand was at the time. Yep. Um, and we had to reestablish first, kind of what was the voice and positioning of the brand, and what the team did was a lot of homework that got us to uh, back to the the where's the beef days of the brand. So, yeah. I mean, one of the most vivid memories in college in my one of my first marketing classes was that commercial. Seen, where's the beef? <laughs> like it changed culture. Yeah. In that commercial era. It really did. And for most of the listeners who are who are young millennials uh, or even Gen Z. What you're referring to is this this commercial that was outrageously famous in the 80s, basically. Yeah. And it was this old woman who who was making fun of other fast food places for not having enough beef in the their sandwiches. And the, jo- the joke was, of course, it was like what Wendy's does, so she's mad at all these other brands. Mm-hmm. But that phrase, where's the beef, became like a slogan for, I mean, like, what? which politician used yeah, it? Yeah, it, it, it was part of the presidential election. Yeah. I think that was Lyndon Johnson <laughs> or something. I don't even know. But yeah. but it was a, it was a, uh, it wasn't Lyndon Johnson, but whatever. It was a, it, it became like a political mantra. I think it was like, Dukakis. It might have been. Yeah. But like, where's the substance behind, you know, your message was yeah. kind of the point of it. And it was one of the first times that a brand really called out other brands. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, again, the 80s, and she, you know, in the commercial, they specifically picked on Burger King and McDonald's. Yeah. And and that was like a watershed moment for brands. Like, you don't talk about other brands. Yeah. So as we went to, you know, talk about what is the voice of this brand in 2011, 2012, um, you know, that was a hallmark moment for us to say, no, this is our brand. This we is are, actually we are, what we're going to we go with. We are a challenger brand, and it's okay yeah. for us to actually pick on other brands and point out that we are a challenger because we're differentiated. And that's what actually started the process. We then, you know, I hired my first social media person by finding, uh, her name was Amy, finding her on Twitter. She was a really snarky young copywriter Perfect. Yeah. who was like the voice that we needed, yep. um, you know, the modern articulation kind of, of 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 this where's the beef mentality. And then we hired a digital agency that sort of had that mentality. And we began with this challenger approach in digital and social and then had a a more product centered approach in things like traditional media like television. Yep. Within, you know, a year and a half ish of us starting this process, it started to get a little press. You know, Forbes wrote an article saying we're destroying brands. And Wall Street Journal wrote an article saying Well you guys were taken uh, there's so much I want to dig into here. But like there was um and and I promise we'll get to we'll get to some some of this stuff. Uh the listeners are tuning in because they're like, we want to hear about Pop Belly or or um you know, or Papa John's or whatever, like we'll, we'll get to that stuff in a bit, but I want to dig into a lot of stuff here because this is stuff that I've legitimately always been interested in wanting to talk to you about. And, um, but one of the things I think is fascinating is like you, you, the beginning of that process, the idea that you're going to go after other brands and be like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a brand personality. I mean, a lot of, so many marketers talk about, What's your brand personality and what's the brand's voice and what's like, and everything sounds the effing same. Like it all sounds, everything comes out the same. And to have, I think the, the, you know, sand to be like, no, we're going to actually like, cause I mean, we're talking about front for, for years, front page of Reddit, Mm -hmm. like posts where people would be like, Wendy's just said this to the Burger King Twitter account. And like that kind of, I mean, literally last week there was a post that was Wendy's was going after, I forget who it was, but it was, yeah, Burger King. Yeah. And it was so funny because I was like, this is exactly like, no, it takes a lot to do that. And I think that the reason that doesn't happen is because you need a group of people who are like, this is our authentic brand voice. What would our authentic brand voice say? Would it call other people out? I mean, it's good that you had that 
that there was that legacy at Wendy's of like mm. this kind of approach. But like to convincing a room full of executives to, or the board or whoever you have to answer to yeah. that you're going to go ahead and do this and start call, you know, calling out other brands or, or, or just being slightly more snarky or aggressive in the marketplace. I feel like that is actually a difficult conversation for a lot of people to have. And before you hired this, I mean, and we'll, I want to dig into this in a second, but before you hired the people you needed to and set off on that kind of messaging, how did you even begin to handle that conversation? What was the pushback that you had or, or did you have any? Yeah, there, there actually was pushback and, and you know, I can't say it was just as simple as us, you know, being snarky on on social. There was a lot more to it than yeah. that. But when you get down to it, we articulated that we are a challenger, and and we actually, you know, every marketer comes up with their little alliterations or whatever. But we were <laughs> we called ourselves a challenger with charm. So yeah. we were a challenger, but one with a wink and a smile. We're never going to be nasty, but we are going to yeah. be bold and yeah. and hold up what we feel differentiates our brand. And I, I would say we had a bit of a benefit that in 2011, 2012, 2013, kind of in the early days of all this. Not a whole lot of brands were blowing up on social. Um, there were yeah. a few, but but by and large, it was because you were really weird or you were really like you know Denny's had a lot of really good stuff back in the day that they still. That's do. true. Yeah, but but it was it wasn't based on sort of a human ish voice in a lot of cases. Most yeah. of them were based on a what still sounded a bit corporate or a bit like I, I understand what this brand is because it's coming from Nike. It's got to be about yeah. you know aspiration kind of thing. We were very human, very human, and, and in fact, most of our back and forth uh, happen in comments, not even in posts. Yeah. So, so, and that was because that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to be kind of this human challenger voice. So, so to answer your question, we did have pushback. And when it first started to happen and we first started to get headlines from the back and forth and, and the challenger mentality, everyone had bought into the idea of challenger, but nobody really understood what that meant until people started talking about it. Mm. It kind of took on a life of its own. And I vividly remember getting calls from, from high level executives at Wendy's, board members, all this stuff, where they were asking questions about is this really what we should be doing? Yeah. Are we comfortable with this? I had PR agencies that were uncomfortable. I had I had legal at one point that was a bit uncomfortable, but I, I had a bit of a benefit that it was early days in social. So not everybody kind of knew what the potential kind of problems would be from it. <laughs> um, but I also had, had the benefit of uh, sales were pretty bad in early days. And yeah. anything that got you know, some attention to the brand that was positive and felt like it had, it had legs to get, you know, positive awareness for the brand, um, was beneficial and we started to grow. Yeah. So the brand started to turn around in those early days where we started to see positive sales in part because of this work. Yeah. So, so it was hard. I, I, I had some very uncomfortable conversations with a lot of folks. I, I was told to fire some people here and there because of particular comments they make. People that today are still a part of the team yeah. that are very successful. So how did you team. so how did you navigate? I just think for the person listening, and I, I, I wonder this a lot myself, is that you know, there are two kinds of I've been thinking about this a lot lately. You know, um guys like Ryan Holiday have written books like uh, The Obstacle is the Way and 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 things like this um or ego is the enemy but there's a reflection that can sometimes take place which is like are we encountering uh obstacles or resistance or whatever you want to call it because we're going the right way and these are the things that we're running into or are we running or are these indications that we actually do need to switch around like i think i think about i think to myself the number of times not even from a marketing perspective i mean you're speaking with the brand voice but i'm thinking from a sales perspective as an individual, sometimes you want to say things like the, you know, Wendy's Twitter account said or made comments on, you know, Facebook or whatever um, and have had executives tell me, like, you guys can't talk that way. You can't speak this way. You have to be exactly this kind of way. And I think, you know, that is that an indication that you need to reflect and change what you're doing or is it an indication that you're like, you know what, this is just uncomfortable for these people because it's different and they don't understand, they don't see it yet. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, what were what were your indications in that moment? Sales maybe sounds like it was one of them, that this was working and it was going in the right way. Yeah, I mean, the, the core of it was it was based in the voice we had defined before we started doing the work. Yeah. So it wasn't an accident. We had said we're a challenger, we're a challenger with charm, this is what that looks like. In fact, we had talked about our, you know, we used at the time Chris Pratt from Guardians of the Galaxy. Is oh my voice. god, that's so good! Yeah, and then we actually had cutouts of him all over the office on, on my team floor. So, so if it sounds like it came from that snarky kind of, you know, backhanded voice, but it's still funny, still likable, still a family kind yeah. of friendly environment. We're not going to drop f bombs, kind of thing. Yep. Then it was appropriate, but 
but one, it was based in a strategy we laid out. So it wasn't random. It yep. wasn't just something that happened. And, and I think most marketers aren't very good at marketing their work mm. and you got to get good at marketing your work. Um, you know, for example, I saw that when my franchisees kids started talking positive about the brand, yeah. it had a huge benefit to me. Ah, got it. So, you know, when, when a franchisee and we were, it's a franchise system at Wendy's. So the majority of stores are franchise. When I had a franchise, a major franchisee, their kids say, I never even thought about your brand until I saw this Yeah, and it came from my team. <laughs> that gives me huge credence to, yeah. to do more work yeah. of that line. Uh, another example is we had moments where we could choose to act on uh, the social voice or not. So a simple example is very early on in this process, Jamie Oliver came out with his pink slime documentary. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you remember that. but Oh, yeah, you bet. Yeah. But he, So he came out <laughs> with his documentary talking about pink slime. And, and I vividly remember being called into the boardroom with the PR you know, agency and our CEO and a couple of members of the board and our CMO and all, you know, C's all around and, and you know, <laughs> and I'm in like my late 20s. I don't yeah. know what the hell I'm doing. And I get called into this room and, and I, you know, sit down at the end of the table and our CEO asks, Brandon, are people talking about Wendy's and this pink slime thing? And I said, yeah, I'm hearing it on social right now. <laughs> oh, it's, man. It's a thing. And, and they said, he asked for an example. So I, there was a computer hooked up to the screen. And again, I'm d young and dumb. I Googled it. And I said, oh, Wendy's no. pink slime. The first <laughs> it's thing just all the worst stuff <laughs> comes up right it's away. It's pretty terrible. So I, I Googled it. And the first thing that came up, and by like a long shot, and I'll mind you, this is like 2011, 2012, early days of this process. I don't exactly remember, but early days. First thing was Yahoo Answers. Yeah. And the Yahoo Answers question was, does Wendy's use pink slime in their hamburgers? And I clicked it and pulled it up, and there's hundreds of people replying. Nobody's got a straight answer. Yeah. So I, I said, uh, yeah, I mean, here's a good example. This is something that, that, that people are asking right now. And, and, and Amos said, well, what should we do about this? And I said, well, do we use pink slime? I knew the answer was no, but I wanted to hear the room say it. Yeah, yeah. And, and our head chef at the time said, never have. We never will use pink slime. It's not something we do. Yeah. Our burgers are fresh, never frozen, went on kind of a tirade of how great our stuff is. So I pulled up the Yahoo Answers and I typed in never have, never will, dash, dash, Brandon, director of digital at Wendy's and hit enter. Yeah. And it went up. And while we were sitting there, it was upvoted to the top thing. Yeah. And it made the news that night. Yeah. So that night, the, uh, you know, as people talked about like the official responses from companies, one of the ones that was in circulation was never have, never will, Brandon, the director of digital Wendy's. Yeah. Yeah. So in moments <laughs> like that where, and, and like everybody in the organization saw this Yeah. Is a they're thing. right there. Yeah. So he's probably like this internet thing. That's yeah. right. So, and so there are moments that you can choose to either kind of act as the voice and you know, is it, it would a PR agency write never have, never will? No, no. But the voice of challenger would be like, of course no. not. We don't yeah. do that. Yeah. So, you know, there are moments that you can act that actually the rest of the organization can recognize. So I, I think you have to become a good marketer for your marketing. Yeah. And, and it sounds crazy, but the truth is, uh, you know, most people, everyone thinks they understand advertising and marketing because they see it every day. Yeah. But 99% of people, and, and I'm not saying I'm even in that 1%, but 99% of people, they just, they don't understand what actually compels people to act. They mm. don't understand what is interesting and unique and differentiated. Mm. They just, the only exposure is, well, I like that joke or I don't like that joke or that ad or whatever. Oh my God, joke is a great example. I mean, I, I'm a comedian ostensibly. This is a comedy podcast. Uh, but it it's fascinating to me because that's a big one is that there's a lot of people who, you know, I mean, Seth Godin even talks about it in his book, This Is Marketing, where he's like, the, he calls it the comedian's problem, where he's like, you you, you can have, a comedian needs an audience, and the problem is that how do you find that audience? Mm -hmm. You can't go to the same shows all the time. You know what I mean? Like, uh, one of the most successful comedians there was, Larry the Cable Guy, I have ne I'm, uh, hardly ever think the guy's funny. Yeah. Huge audience for him, yeah. and it's just, I'm just not his audience. Amy Schumer, her leather special, lots of comedians didn't like it. I didn't really like it. Some people love it. I'm just not their audience, and it's funny because it's like people think when it, you can argue with someone about drama and whether or not a movie is good if it's like, you know, Little Women that just came out or something. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. I haven't even seen it. 
1917, another good example. You can like it. You can watch it and go, yeah, I don't really care for it. But if somebody goes, no, but it's good because X, Y, Z reason. Talk them into it. Yeah, they can go, all right, well, I didn't sound my cup of tea, but I understand why it's a good movie. You can't do that yeah, with a joke. Either funny or not Yeah, to you, you either laughed or you didn't laugh. <laughs> and, most, and most advertising is based on either being funny or just generally being interesting. Mm. And it's a, it's a very gut reaction that you have 15 seconds yeah. to convey or less in social. I mean, you look at progressive. I always think about, uh, or not progressive, um, uh, progressive. Who are the ones with the cavemen? That was uh, Geico. Geico. Pardon yeah, me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I look at Geico's brand voice, and you think that's. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing and who they're talking to. That one, like when when YouTube started doing, you know, five second commercials before videos, yeah. they solved the problem by having having things that would cause you to want to keep watching, and the voice would just be like, "That's it. We've you, yeah. you can't click past this commercial because it's already over." And I think. That they knew their voice, they knew what they were doing. They have a perspective. All of their commercials has have different points of view. Yeah. It's either the gecko or the the caveman or the like the whatever. And they they really understood what they were doing. And it, it it's just very interesting to me that like many many marketers approach the market with this kind of really weird watered down sort of like I you know I I it almost makes me wonder like why you know, even employ like a whole bunch of companies employ tons of these people and you think, oh, what, did, what was going on? Yeah. And, you know, so I guess let me back up because that there's a question in there. And I guess the question is, how did you see or at what point did you see how this was going to develop at Wendy's? I mean, you couldn't have had this, you know, unless unless you're truly a genius. <laughs> So how did you see where this sort of this was going? Because I feel like a lot of brands have now attempted to kind of take your yeah. model and what you've done and and apply it as in like we have an actual person. And and uh, and I haven't even gotten to talking about the person you hired to actually like tweet out this stuff. Nobody was doing that at that point. Yeah, yeah. Like so I'm wondering how did you you know, where did you see where this kind of roadmap was going or or was it a process of learning as you were moving through it? There, there was a bit of process. But but again, we outlined at the start that the voice is challenger with charm yeah that there were certain rules around that in fact i mentioned chris pratt kind of as the the guy i just i that. love that so much yeah, man. The, 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 <laughs> i would argue today it's a little more anna kendrick but it's the same sort of vibe right yeah. it's the same sort of snarky educated young you know quick wit kind of vibe that doesn't really take any you know any garbage from anybody but when you get down to it um I think establishing that up front and then creating rules around that that are loose enough that someone can actually be interesting and creative. So a simple example, one of the first big things that blew up when after we hired our, our first people uh, to actually do the work, um, it was you know they would text me if something is just uh, you know two inches past the line, and I'd say yes or no, and that's all the infrastructure there was. Yeah, you know that when when you know one of the last things that hit right before I left was. Nugs for Carter, you know, this moment where we had <laughs> this kid asking for free chicken nuggets and the response happened at 10 o'clock at night, you know, that blew up <laughs> the next day and became still, I think it's still one of the most viral moments in history. It's, the, I think it's still the most retweeted moment there there has yeah. been for a brand. <laughs> and and that literally was a text between me and one person at 10 o'clock at night where he's like, can I offer the guy free nuggets if, if I say this? Yeah. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and it was that simple. It's just create the infrastructure that allows it to happen within certain rules. Yeah. And hire people that can actually live the 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 strategy you've laid out. Yeah. You know, finding the right people. You know, the guy who's who is the primary person who tweets right now for Wendy's is a comedian by trade. That's yeah. his job. Yeah. You who know, is they, it? And, is he uh, he's in Columbus? Yeah, is he, well he's not in Columbus. He's works for the agency. It's kind of okay, I got it. But they, they've got a team of people, but sure. it's at the agency. But um but you know, he um you know, he is a comedian by trade. Amy was a copywriter by trade. Yep. You know, the people that were hired to do this work, they weren't, you know, they weren't interns, you know, 20 somethings that understood the space. That's not how it works. You have to hire people that actually are the, the, the strategy. Yeah, the thing. You know, because in real time, that's what you default to is your own sort of personality and attitude. Yeah. You know, this guy who's doing it today, he can rip people to shreds in a back and yep. forth on stage as a comedian. And he needs to be able to do that to a brand on Twitter in real time. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yep. Um, so... So it did evolve over time, but having said that, we were very clear on what this is and what it isn't. We also decided actively that we wouldn't take that into some mediums. So the mediums that are heavier, older audiences like television, we yeah, decided wouldn't we'd work. touch it, yeah. but we wouldn't, we wouldn't be full on. Yep. So we had moments where we brought it in, but it didn't become the voice in some channels. Yep. Uh, so it primarily lives in the platforms where it's appropriate to live. 
Um, I feel like that's a big, but that even then, I mean, there's two lessons you can pull out of that. One is simple rules, which I feel like makes a huge difference. I mean, like just having a small set of simple rules that are easy to follow, huge. Mm -hmm. And, and then giving people sort of the freedom to work within those and around those. And then secondly, I mean, this, the idea that the brand voice might vary from channel to channel or space to space. I mean, then it makes sense. Like there's, there, there, it doesn't make sense. I mean, when I f reflect on some of my more frustrating experiences when I've been working with sales teams, like doing coaching or whatever, um, the, the thing that's been kind of frustrating has been people who are controlling brand voice being like, oh yeah, you can't. I don't want you to use the word. I just think of the most, the one that was so frustrating to me was we're not an, we're not an agency. We're a software company that offers boutique agency like services. And I'm like, dude, if it, if I get a sale by saying we're an agency, I'm going to say agency. Yeah, yeah. Like to the person who we're working with, the work doesn't make a difference. I understand why you want to do this, but the way that I feel like we approach this internally, it just makes more sense to me. It's just, there's some amount of flexibility that people have to have. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think marketing is one of the few areas in the business world where there's not a lot of formal training mm. to do the work. Like if you're, it's a really good point. If you're in finance, you know, you know how to, to do what you need to do in Excel to get your job done. Yeah. Right? And if you majored in marketing in college, you were a rich girl. In a lot of cases. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I started as a biology major. People, people do this because they either love advertising or because they fall into it for salesy reasons or there's a million yeah. things. Yeah. But I mean, I, I've met very few brand managers who actually understand what good advertising looks like. Yeah. You know, when, when I, when I'm interviewing people, generally the questions I ask have nothing to do with the infrastructure of what got you your MBA or whatever the hell you have. Yeah. It's always like, who Who's doing an awesome job and why do you like what they're doing yeah because the the palette you develop that over time on like what what is a actual compelling thing to say to human beings to get them to want to pay attention to your brand i just love i love that you just said that like that because i, I constantly i this is when i do sales consulting and coaching i i constantly and, and I, honestly a lot of these lessons came from the world of comedy for me which is like your you people forget we're talking to humans yeah. and and somewhere there's a person with eyes looking at your work or hearing it if it's on the radio or if it's you know, over the phone or whatever. And you have to do something in that space that causes them to have thoughts or feelings or reactions to that. And I think a lot of people, for some reason, they get really obsessed with the, what are the numbers and where are our numbers moving and how do we, and you're like, if that's all you care about, we're never gonna, nobody gets excited to buy a Frosty because of your numbers being awesome. Yeah. Like that's not the reason they're going to do it, but they're going to do it because they saw your brand all day and it's really funny and I'm hungry and there's a Wendy's right here. That's and right. like that, right. that makes sense. Um, I want to, I want to move on a little bit because I feel like that part is, uh, we can tread over that ground a whole lot, but like, I just, it's super fascinating to me that you were able to do that and like, and, and take a lot of success and make a lot of success in that place. And, and in a way that I feel like a lot of people have now repeated and, and attempted to capture. And I think the best part about it for me, I think part of the reason I like I like it so much is that th there are so many brands that have attempted to be like that now and have failed miserably, <laughs> like, like well, I mean, online. It, it, I, I, think, I think a lot of people assume, and I've heard this from from folks that have you know called me to consult on things or asking me about kind of how how we did what we did. They assume that the the surface, that just the you know snarky reply is all you need. Yeah, and and it's deeper than that. It is it is a strategy that you set up, and I know that that seems you know whatever. But when you get down to it, if you don't have a core kind of reason that your brand should behave like this, yeah, it all falls apart. One snarky comment, one joke lasts a day, and yeah. that's it. You have to. I mean, it took us probably a year of getting noticed regularly, like once a month or more often on places like Reddit before anybody started talking about our market. I mean, back in the early 2000s, 2010, 2011 kind of days, fast food was evil. Yeah. I mean, we were making kids fat. We were, oh, yeah. you know, it was, it was all about, you know, minimum wage. It was just bad. It was all of it was bad. Yeah. So, so once we started to actually be the cool mom kind of thing, <laughs> the cool you know, that, mom. That, took, that took time. It took yeah. persistence. That that's what a brand is built on. You know, Nike isn't Nike because the Kaepernick ad it's, yeah. it's, it is because of the hundreds of ads like the Kaepernick yeah. ad. Yeah. So it's, it's a persistence thing that I think most brands don't have the patience for. Yeah. There's a lot of, that's, it's something I feel like that patience is something that's fascinating to me too, is it's like, there's, there's so many people who want to come in and claim quick wins, and you think the amount of, the amount of uh, transformational change, or the amount of like, you know, if you really want, I mean, uh, Jim Collins talks about this in Good to Great a lot, which is like the problem that a lot of 
people have when they're attempting to make changes in an organization and in in the world through an organization are that they never uh, they never really take a look at what this is going to take yeah and they're too focused on i just i i left working with a team uh, a sales team um a, a last a little over a, about a year ago because the problem was that everybody was so focused on short term wins which is yeah. like how are we going to get to our number this month you know like look that's important we need to get to our number but like if every month we're just trying to sprint to a line we're never going to get into the mechanics of good running yep. and that's that seems to be the issue and you're i think it's fascinating because what you laid out and what i you know what i hear you saying is like look we we from the beginning had a foundation of what we wanted to do and everything we did we built over time, a scaffolding and an infrastructure that allowed this brand to navigate in the marketplace in a way that resonated with people. Yep, yep. It's 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 a it's a big thing that you know that a lot of especially publicly traded companies are worried about tomorrow, and they tend to sacrifice kind of next week for today all the time. Yeah, and and understanding that every every move a brand makes should build on the last move and ultimately get you further ahead. Yeah, uh, is is a big change. I mean, I'm I'm two year almost at the two year mark at Pop Belly right now, and we're just starting to see progress. Yeah, it takes time. It took two years before, or a year and a half before I saw my first quarter positive comp. Yeah, at Wendy's. Now, mind you, we ran on a, a 28 quarter run after that. Yeah, but it took a year and a half to move. You know, this giant ship to start actually seeing positive momentum, and it wasn't just the work my team did; it's the team a yeah. lot of people did. Yeah. But that's the point is all this stuff has to build on each other and you can get one week that's great. You can get one month that's great. But if you can't string together, you know, consistent uh, results, you're, you're never going to make real progress. Yeah, that's the difference between a tactic and a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about you at Pomp Belly. Um, this is so this is fascinating to me because this I love I really have always liked the Pop Belly brand. The first Pop Belly that I went to was in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2000 and five maybe maybe i'm trying to think it would had just there was like one of the few pop bellies that had like opened after pop belly started expanding yeah, i think yeah. yeah and i had never my experience with like any kind of sandwich place before then had been subway basically yeah, yeah. which by that point was already in the marketplace was like oh, this is kind of crappy like yeah, yeah. and so walking into a pop belly was like holy shit there's a sandwich place that's like really good yeah and then like you know was uh you know, and then consistently has been. So it's fascinating because uh, it, there's there's a really strong Pop Belly. I feel like has a strong brand presence in terms of like the footprint, and then in terms of understanding the aesthetic. I think in a lot. So it's interesting for you, kind of coming over here because you they. I feel I don't know this, but it looked from the movements and again in the marketplace, it looked like they wanted you like bad. Yeah. And then we're and we're like yeah, let's get right in here. Um, there was almost no daylight between you leaving, uh, you know, Papa John's and moving over here. Yeah. Um, so what has been your work here? What's been like the focus in terms of trying to transform sort of the digital presence and not just digital because you're CMO here, yeah, yeah. but like any sort of marketing presence here? Yeah. So, you know, this is a brand that uh, has been around for a long time. It's been around since the 70s, but really only had a serious presence in Chicago for a long time. You yeah. know, it, was, it was a handful of shops and in the early 2000s started to expand and and now is about 500 shops throughout the the country, um, and some internationally. Yeah, yeah. And the this is this is a brand that um, has a really good sense of of its product lineup. It has a really good sense of sort of its position against folks like Subway and, and other competitors. What it hasn't done is communicate externally that position at all. Yeah. So it's a brand that has not run marketing to any serious extent. Yeah. It's a brand that is is actually very uh, has very low awareness outside of Chicago. Mm. So you go to a city like Dallas or or, or Washington D.C. and it's a little higher, but but by and large, most people either don't know Potbelly exists or forget that mm. it exists. Mm. Uh, especially in a market that's very saturated. Think about the Firehouse and Jimmy John's and Jersey Mike's and Subway. Yeah. You know, there's there's a million sub shops out there. So. What attracted me to this brand actually was I love a good story to tell, mm. and and what pulled me into Wendy's was where's the beef? Yeah, you know that was a great story to, <laughs> to build off of. What pulls me into here is this is an extremely commoditized market. Yeah, you know you got the Subways and Jimmy Johns and Jersey Mikes of the world that are all kind of talking about the same stuff. Mm. It's all very product centered. It's all price point or you know ingredient based discussions. 
pot belly actually has an aesthetic and an environment that yeah. is totally differentiated. You cannot, you said it, but you can't walk into a pot belly and mistake it for a subway. That's exactly, it's impossible. yeah, totally true. So it has got, and I a, would say same thing is you, you're, you're gonna, you, you know, you're not at a Jersey Mike's, you know, you're not at a, a firehouse subs, you know, you're not at a subway, you know, you're not at a, a it, 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 the, in, in, in the early days of me going to pot belly that I think part of the reason we all like to go was you're like, it feels like you're at an actual, yeah. like, like the original store. Yep. In, uh, in so Chicago. it's got, it's got a totally different vibe. And for that reason, it can communicate very differently mm. to the world. Now, you know, and in, in when you do the homework on a brand, when you first come to a brand, your your first job is to is to dig real hard and figure out what's going on, why are people sticking around or not, why do people love it, why do people hate it, all that stuff. And what we learned, and, and this is all in public filings, so you can find it. What we learned was we got some some things to fix in the brand. Every brand has that stuff. Yeah. Wendy's had that stuff. Uh, Papa John's had that stuff. So so every brand I've been to has that stuff. It's taken us a bit of time to start to uncover that stuff and figure out how to fix it. So that's really been what I've been working on over the last year and a half. Mm. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of advertising. You know, I've run a little bit here and there. We've had, you know, 10 or 15 viral-ish moments, but nothing like we ever had at Wendy's. Yeah. Because that's not where my focus is right now. I got to get the basics kind of set. The team here has to get the basics yeah. in play first. Once we get that set, and, and that's all kind of in motion now, um, once we get all that stuff set, that's when we can actually establish what the voice is and 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 convey that at a higher a level. And it's very different than Wendy's. Yeah. You know, this isn't a brand that's going to be snarky. Yeah. This isn't a brand. It just doesn't fit. It's not what it is. Now, I've no. done it a little bit just to see what, what yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah. respond to it. <laughs> you know, I picked on Subway a little in social just to see what happens. And people do respond to it well. Yeah. But I think I remember too. seeing that one on Reddit maybe even. Yeah. Well, we had a few that we were we were, uh, we were were jabbing a little bit just to see what happens. But when you get down to it, this, this is a very different brand. The yeah. aesthetic is different. The vibe is different. So I wouldn't expect... I'm not going to hire another Amy or another, you know, VML that does does the social voice for for Wendy's for for this brand. Yeah, it needs something different. Um, so we actually just hired an, a new agency. They're starting to do work. I'm actually going out next week to shoot a bunch of new ads, and and we're going to be putting some stuff into market over the next few months. That are that's exciting. That are, yeah, that are that are starting to actually reposition this brand, and we've already begun to do it. So over the last six months or so, we've shifted the way we talk to the to the market. We've changed the kind of products we put in market. Mm. Um, we're actually running some tests on making some pretty serious changes to to focus the menu and focus the brand. Yeah, uh, going forward because it's just every brand needs something different. Yeah. You know, I worked on tech companies in the agency side. You know, I couldn't have pulled Wendy's plan out of that. It no. Just, it wouldn't. Yeah. It's not possible. So I'm here because there's a really good story to tell. And this is a brand that can actually break out of a very commoditized space. And the runway is huge. Yeah. It, it's absolutely huge. I mean, I think it's cool that you, I mean, the, the, the two things that I think I'm hearing there that I really like are, uh, it's, I mean, once again, to return to Jim Collins is like this. There's a track record of people walking into situations and going, oh, I know what needs to change, and then immediately crashing and burning. And you're like, no, 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 there's a lot. There's a nuanced, you know, kind of market position and people. And it's funny because as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I'm like, I do. It, there's a distinct brand that Popular has that's different. Um, and I, I guess I wouldn't know how to characterize yeah. that voice either. And, and I'd, I'd argue that is a function of them having not communicated a voice. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I can't tell you what it is yet, but you're going to see it in the next few months, at least come to life in a few markets as we test and, and go from there. But um, but when you get down to it, uh, a brand that is differentiated has to be very clear on what it's differentiated on, mm. what makes it interesting, what is the what is the thing that draws in the niche of people. And it's not everybody, Yeah. but that niche of people. You know, if you, if you see that snarky, post from Wendy's and you're, you know, 65 years old and it totally turns you off to the brand. <laughs> guess what? I didn't care. Uh, yeah. Cause that's not what I needed. <laughs> you know, I needed to draw on the 22 year old, not yeah. the, not the 65 year old. Pop is going to be the exact same way. There's going to be moments where some people will see it and be like, well, that's just not for me. What I really want is a 299 sub. Yeah. And I'm like, well, have at it. Take your, <laughs> take your gas station sub and throw it in the trash on your way into pot belly. Cause you actually want a decent <laughs> lunch. So we're going to have a niche, and that niche is going to be unique to this brand, and, and that's actually what I think a lot of marketers have to to stretch to, you know, what it, who is the audience I'm trying to talk to, and what is my differentiated space yeah. that I can that I can actually uh, be compelling in the market, especially in a very crowded market like we're in for a sandwich shop. I'm excited to see it, man. Um, I uh, so you, I, I'm fascinated. Where where is the, some of this stuff going to come out? I mean, so I, I can't gonna... talk about it in too much detail. Okay, but we've it. got we've got some test markets coming up. We're actually going to talk about some of the stuff in our filings of of of, of where we're going here, but. 
but you know we're starting to see some progress but really the the big progress comes when when the brand really starts to come on full bore and, and that 2020 is going to be a big year for us i'm excited I, i'm excited to see it. i i just i've always liked pop belly i guess which is why i like it it was yeah. cool to see that you've kind of moved over here um it's kind of weird to be like uh it's like i don't know how to describe this it's not like i'm like a fan of your career it's hard to like it's it's a weird thing it's just that because i was trying to harass you for so long <laughs> and then like because of the because of all the exposure i feel yeah. like that you had when you were at wendy's and stuff um let, let me step back and i know there's stuff that we you've mentioned that you can't uh, you can't talk about or might not be appropriate to talk about but i'm curious kind of what was going on a little bit at papa john's and yeah. i know that like the public statement that i think um you ended up making was uh you know we I, I came in here to want to like do some change looks like maybe the brand wasn't quite ready for that yeah. which i feel like is in a very political way to you know to say i was like Ugh, i wonder what was going on inside of that statement yeah well i mean you can you can go back and look at sort of the history that happened either while i was there or shortly after i left but, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's all right uh, there you go it's it's pretty clear that it was just a brand that was it needed change yep and and I was brought in as one of those change agents to help yep. change the brand, and I wasn't ready for it. Mm. So since then, they've gone through another CMO. So there's a guy that came and left. Oh man! You know, since then, and they have a new CEO in now, Rob Lynch, guy genius from Arby's. Yep. So they're making big changes there. It's just, you know, I loved Papa John's because it was one of the commoditized space products that actually was a good. Base product. I it was thought. a great product. You know, I mean, I'm sitting in Chicago. I can't talk about any chain pizza being amazing. But when you get down to it, <laughs> you know, that's part of the reason I went to Wendy's. Yeah. Wendy's was one of the few fast food burgers I would eat. You know, I loved yeah. Wendy's as a as a product. And you know, you look at Papa John's. I would argue it was the same sort of space. So I thought there's the ability to break out of that commoditization yep. and be interesting and unique and, and and especially in a market that tends to be a little younger, tends to be a little more you know, interested in the moment versus, you know, long-term thinking kind of thing. And it just wasn't ready for it. And that's okay. That's, that's how it rolls. Yeah. You know? Why, why not? I, and if, and if there's something you can't go into there for one reason or another, that's totally fine. But I'm yeah. really curious why, cause I'm, I'm equally as curious, not just why an organization got the change and why it happened, but why one didn't. And yeah. cause, cause I mean, Papa, I would agree with you on everything that you said is like Papa John's. It was a surprise to me when I did the, uh, I went to the UK a few years ago to do comedy for a while, for a while. And one of the things that I, I was like, Oh, we should get Papa John's There's Papa John's around the corner. And they were like, Oh man, no. And I was like, are you kidding? That's like the best of the yeah. fast food pizza places in America. Yep. And I, I it was surprising that that didn't reach, I guess it's a different model overseas, but the point of me mentioning that is just to say that it, it, I would agree with you on all those points, and yeah. and for a really long time had 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 the strongest brand, yeah. and I'm uh, kind of curious why that like they were resistant to that. Yeah. So my experience is every organization is a victim of its own past. So the momentum, the oh, thing that that's makes heavy. You, well, I mean, it's just true. The 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 history that made you successful looms large yeah. over the organization. So. You can go back to what made Papa John's big. It was really the sports yeah, affiliation, huge, right? So, and I and I heard these stories while I was there. You know, we put our name on a stadium, and sales went up 30 percent for yep. two years. Yep. You know, as soon as we nailed, as soon as we got this this uh, celebrity endorsement, this happened. So it was no different at Wendy's. Wendy's for years, television drove everything. Dave actually being on television yeah. drove everything. So the the momentum behind, like the thing looming over everything, was you need television to make it successful. And in the case of Papa John's, you need sports and you need these huge sponsorships to make it suspend to make it successful. You have to be, you know, in these environments because that's what it, what made it successful. And what happens is, when that stuff stops working, the organization doesn't realize it stops working. They assume that we're just not doing it right anymore. Yeah. So they assume well, more TV will actually help, or or more sports sponsorships will help, or mm. whatever. And and that's that's detrimental to an organization that has to move past whatever it is yeah. they were doing that, that everyone caught up to them. So, so you look at Papa John's, you look at Wendy's, you look at any of these companies, when, when someone comes in a, a intended to be a change agent to say, my job here is to, to people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because they're yeah. like, none of nothing in my past suggests that you're right. Yeah. They're the, uh, they're the, this is the equivalent of the guy who peaked in high school. Yeah, it is. It is. And and I had I had very difficult conversations at Wendy's at Papa John's. What do you mean and, lifting weights doesn't work anymore? That's right. Yeah. So I mean, where people just they they say everything in my being says you're wrong. Yeah. 
and you're like all their instincts are pointed in a different direction. Yeah. So and and, and fortunately at pop at at, uh, at pop belly, I don't have a lot of that history, so I'm not actually fighting a lot of that uphill. That what I'm fighting at at pot belly or was fighting when I first started anyways is the idea that you need to market at all yeah and a lot of brands are still in that position yeah they're in that position that well just the fact that we are cool and interesting like yeah. we were 30 years ago yeah means that we're going to be successful well, I, I, I but there's something I mean I could so totally see that because like just like what I was telling you is like I've pot belly has indelibly been marked in my brain because in yeah. 2005 I walked into the pot belly at the corner of uh, what state and, and Liberty in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and was like, I've never had anything like this before in a place like this. And the sandwich was wonderful. Yeah. And and that's it. That's stuck in my head. And, and if you're the my guy... My research says 99% of people have never done that. Yeah. And that's the problem. <laughs> so I need, yeah. to, I need to get, you know, just a small slice yeah. of the human population to have that moment you had. Yeah. And then I... Except I got you got to translate it somehow in front of... Yeah, that... Right. I, I feel like that... What a weird window to have to move through. You're like... I mean, a mental gymnastics required to understand that experience. I mean, no wonder you're taking, you know, time with it and being careful yeah. with it because... I mean, and, it, and again, it's the same everywhere. Tech companies back in the, you know, the day working at the agency side, you couldn't get people past feature benefit. Hmm. You know, they always wanted to talk about stats. You know, if you remember the Intel yeah. days of 433 megahertz. Or oh, yeah, they just would constantly talk about. And from Going from that to Intel inside yeah. is a crazy transition. Yeah. You know, because that's not what they think. You yeah. Know, it's, it's all about the niche of, of what actually compels all a new audience to show up. Yeah. And and it really is based on breaking from that history and, <sighs> and trying it enough. I got to figure this out for my comedy, That's Brandon. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you got to find out that the, who is actually, you know, what what is that new thing? that actually drives enough people in that it matters. And that's I, a really hard organizational change to make. Obviously, everybody's trying to figure that out, I feel like, for everything they're doing. And what's weird is in the in the world we live in today, this is why I was talking to somebody recently, and they were like, um, are you, why are you interviewing the CMO of this company? And I was like, I, and then I had to go through the fucking, uh, pardon my F-bomb, uh, the, the st- and I'm like, dude, I've been following since you said Wendy's. And like all this. So one, and I was like, I'm meeting this dude. I made it a, pr- one of the reasons that if I'm good at, s- had been good at sales, one of the reasons I was, was because I would, at a certain point, I'd be like, oh, this is personal. That's like, right. I know, <laughs> I know enough about you to know why we should talk yeah, yeah. and it's going to be great. And I'm going to figure out how to do it. And so, uh, I, I think as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to message my team and I'm going to be like, I, guys all used to work with like 40 years ago there and be go. like, I made it happen. <laughs> finally, had the finally had a conversation with him. Um, but anyway, uh, to get back to, I guess what I was saying is like, everybody's trying to figure this out. Like we live in this world where, you know, part of the reason I want to talk to you is I'm like, everybody is trying to figure out what their digital voice is. Yeah, everybody yeah. is trying to figure out what their voice. I mean, like, you know, Dale Carnegie wrote, uh, how to win friends and influence people because in the 1920s, people were shifting into a world in which everybody had to be a salesman because every, everything was becoming thought work. Yep, yep. And now everybody has to be a digital marketer. Everybody's got a personal brand. Everybody has to like do the, how does that stuff work? I know tons of comedians who are like, if I'm just good enough at telling jokes, I'll get booked on everything. No, you won't. Yeah. Like people who you'll get, I'm sure you'll do well, but like at a certain point, you got to figure out how to meet a new audience and, uh, and, and how, and, and how are you going to do that authentically? How are you going to stay in integrity with yourself? How are you going to, you know, what are the ways that you end up doing that? It's yeah. fascinating that it is, it is. And I, I think it's actually a wonderful thing. And, and it, I know it adds pressure and it makes it, you know, a little strange that, that people have to be good at things that maybe they're, they're uncomfortable with. But when you get down to it, if you ask me that kind of the way marketing has evolved and the way communications have evolved, it's democratized the ability to actually get attention. Mm. You know, McDonald's was spending 25 times what I was spending at Wendy's on advertising. Yeah. There's no way I can out TV them. It's I've never seen them on impossible. the front page of Red at once. That's my point. My except point for, except you, wait, except for people having fights in a McDonald's. There you go. <laughs> so, but that's my point. My point is, you know, we, you can, you can actually through a good strategy, you do need some money behind it. So I'm not, not to say that, you know, you can do it without any funding. It needs funding and it needs a good team. But when you get down to it, you know, the, the strategy can actually can jump up and, and be noticed even if you don't have the benefit of a gargantuan organization behind you. So the fact that a company like Stakem gets attention online, the fact that Moon Pie gets attention online, the oh, fact yeah. that, that Wendy's, little Wendy's in 2011 when they were in 12, when they were considered you know, the evil empire, you know, tiny <laughs> empire, but evil empire, can actually become interesting to people. And, and people can say, I relate to this this brand that sells cheeseburgers, I think is awesome. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful world we live in that a good strategy with the right backing 
can actually grow a brand that that is worth growing. Yeah, um, I so think it's I think it's fun to watch. Uh, I think it's we're entering in a unique time where it's fun to watch brands communicate with each other yeah. <laughs> on official channels it's online. Really meta, isn't it? It's it's, it's scary. really wild. Yeah, it's yeah. like a we're like living in. a... am not sure if it's you know it's if it's if it's carnival esque or Kafka esque or or if it's a if it's like a beautiful thing. But it's like it's fascinating to watch because you're like these are two. There are people behind. There are people behind computers and either organization. With a team of people being like, how do we respond to them right yeah, now? It's, it's, it's crazy. And and there are platforms right now that are almost untouched. I mean, you go to the TikToks of the world and and even places like LinkedIn. And it sounds IGTV, crazy. IGTV. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it sounds crazy, but there are platforms right now that actually are exploding. And Quora. brands, aren't, brands yeah. aren't good at yet. Yeah. You know, the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and, and the Instagrams in the world are relatively saturated. So if you want to follow oh, yeah. a formula, you can follow a formula and you can distribute your content. <laughs> You know, but if you want to really be noticed, that may not be the place to even start anymore, which is which is awesome. I mean, I just think like uh, Trader Joe's just started doing their podcast. They have like their third season of their podcast now. And it's like it's fascinating to listen to. And you think like, how do these guys I mean, Chernobyl on HBO launched a podcast with Peter Sagal from Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me here in Chicago, interviewing the creator of the show. And it was one of the most fascinating. You think like, why, why, I wonder sometimes why don't more brands do that stuff? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, there are, especially with a podcast, I know you're talking, you, we should probably wrap this up soon because I know you got to roll the other stuff. But um, I think like, why, why don't brands employ things like podcasts or employ yeah. things like YouTube or, I mean, it's I not. even, as for as much as I bashed Subway, I have to hand it to them. They created a, sh- a short a series. series on Hulu yeah, that yeah. I, was good. It yeah, was yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it, it boils down to, you know, it's not in the, in the kind of standard book that you pull off the shelf and you say, this is measurable. This is something my agency can handle. This is yeah. something that I can wrap my head around how to pitch internally. I mean, I would argue Snarky Wendy wasn't something off the shelf that we could easily pitch. So that's why it had to have almost no investment to, to be to, successful. To work, yeah. You know, at first. And mind you, it's one of the biggest parts of the spend, you know, yeah. once it becomes successful. But uh, but I think it's an awesome – the Wild West in marketing right now is awesome because as long as you have a great voice, a good idea, a unique perspective, and a little, you're willing to take a little bit of risk and spend a little bit of money – you can get noticed, and that's that's amazing, especially for smaller brands. I, I don't want to be at a brand today that has shackles on it because they're so big that they're afraid to do anything interesting. Ooh. Yeah, I feel, I, what a boring situation it's, that would be. Ter- I mean, you got I don't care if you got a billion dollars to spend like they have down the street at McDonald's. It's actually not a wonderful position to be in because you're, you're tied to certain tactics that you know aren't going to get you as much – reach isn't going to grow your brand as much as as the smaller guys can play mm. so that mid-sized to smaller size brand those are the ones that are doing the cool stuff right now i think it's exciting um have you taken the myers briggs just out of curiosity i have not i've heard of it but i'm curious taken. what you would get i don't know uh i'm I, you should take 16 personalities.com oh, yeah. i would i would i would Let's be uh out. they don't they don't like sponsor this or anything oh, but okay. <laughs> I, I just is curious what you would end up getting uh well cool man i where can um where can people uh follow you follow your stuff follow pop belly yeah i mean I, i'm on twitter at, at b road i don't post a whole lot but i'm i'm on it mostly just watching really cool people talk about really cool things uh you know i'm out on linkedin if you want to connect with me ask me any questions certainly find me r-h-o-t-e-n is my last name i'm one of like four in the planet so yeah. it's not hard to find that <laughs> but past that pay attention to pop belly in 2020 2021 it's yeah. gonna get interesting here um, you know, I, I know it seems like we've been a little bit quiet over the last year, year and a half, uh, but that's by design. We're doing our homework and testing a lot of things and, and, uh, and this brand should, uh, should get very interesting. That's exciting. Year, so. Yeah. And you, to your credit, you've always been responsive, uh, to like things I've, I, you know, I, even when I was trying to hound you <laughs> to like pitch you on doing mobile marketing with vibes or whatever, uh, you would, I mean, you would respond like, nope, or like, nope. no thanks, yeah. but you would totally do it. Yeah. And so, uh, you are, and you were very responsive on Twitter. So that's not a joke. Uh, well, thank you so much, Brandon. I appreciate you taking the time, man. This is uh, this has been a great conversation legitimately. Thanks and, uh, I would, we should do a revisit of in, in a year after the, uh, after the, the monumental 2020 and, it, and see how it all Let's went out. It. Sounds good. Uh, thanks so much, man. Meanwhile, the madness continues. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks so much for listening to the Madness Continues podcast. Once again, this is Brendan Lemon. If you liked what you listened to, please take a minute to like, to subscribe, to give us a rating. It really does mean a difference. I say us like there's more than one person doing this. Uh, it's just me, everybody. So every little bit of support you can lend would be really appreciated by me. If you want to share this podcast, it would really, really, really mean a lot to me. I hope you come back. I hope you listen and check out the other podcast I produce, Funny Planet, where we talk to different comedians from all over the world about what they're doing and how they are funny in their own cultures. You can learn a thing or two and you'll have a laugh too. Anyway, take care. Take it easy. We'll see you here next time.